Okay, so I find it really hard to pick favourite anythings, but I try to narrow down my reading from this year into my, let's call them my standouts maybe? Favourite's really hard, so these are books that I have not been able to get off my mind, have made a home in my heart, and books that I think about again and again and I've been recommending more than others. Managed to break it up into two categories. We've got fiction and we've got non-fiction. Unsurprisingly, fiction is longer than the non-fiction because I'm a literary fiction girl at heart. Um, these aren't in any particular order either because that would just be too difficult a task. So I'll go through the fiction, then we'll go through the non-fiction, and hopefully you have some recommendations for 2023. So first up I have Written on the Body by Jeanette Winterson, which I definitely picked up because of Rebecca Eats books, and she was not wrong. This book was just... If you want to read a book that's about desire and love and lust and about bodies coming together and how desire leaves an imprint on you and how it can inform the decisions that you make and how meeting people can just really have such a big impact on your life especially when you develop feelings for them written on the body is a perfect book for that and it has a, a section of the book which is all about the different senses and there's one passage i think it's related to the sense of taste and the protagonist is describing her lover as an olive and it is the most sensual, stunning writing I've ever read and I think about it regularly. Okay, next up we have Paradise Rot, which was disgusting and gorgeous and it was such a visceral experience reading that book. I felt like I could feel everything that was being described. I could smell it, I could taste it. It was such an, a real experience reading that book. Like I almost went into a completely different space and another book that I still think of like regularly. <laughs> um, this is about almost like a coming of age book. We have the protagonist moving to a different city for university and it's like cultures colliding, different personalities and people colliding, different ideas of the world. It's in this big warehouse that's being divided up and the sounds and the smells and things that go on in that warehouse are written so perfectly that you are experiencing them, experiencing them along with the protagonist. There's a high level mention of pee, so if you're like squeamish in that kind of way, maybe not the book for you, but there's lots of like rotting and mould and all of these sorts of things and it's almost like how it feels like the fall in Eden or someone being corrupted, but it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just how things can creep into your life and into your mind and kind of settle in and manifest in a way and yeah, I still think of that book regularly. I loved it so much. Then Elena Ferrante's The Lost Daughter. Um, I feel like this book is the perfect distillation of what Ferrante does so well. So we have a mother figure who has gone on holiday and she's not the typical mother figure that society, you know, allows us to be. She is very much doing her own thing and trying not to feel guilty about it. She even says at one point that, you know, she's a terrible mother, she wasn't born to be a mother, it's not in her person to have that role. And I guess Ferrante is just showing us this facet of motherhood that doesn't get depicted very often and she does it so well. This woman is a person completely in herself, she doesn't need to be a mother to have some sort of role, to have some sort of personality, she is simply herself. And the there's like a pulsing undercurrent of tension that just builds and builds and builds throughout the book. I remember feeling so uneasy to the point of like feeling a little bit nauseous when I was reading it because the tension was just so unbearable and I feel like that's something that Ferrante does really well because I felt the same way when I was reading The Days of Abandonment last year. Um, also the film adaptation of this that was directed by Maggie Gyllenhaal is 
perfect. It is done so well. I would highly recommend both the book and the film. Um, yeah. Then the next book on my list, which kind of ties into The Lost Daughter, is Motherhood by Sheila Hetty. So again, we have a writer giving space and giving a voice to this questioning side of motherhood, like not being a perfect mother and um, figuring out if that's something that you want for your life and being allowed to have that conversation with yourself and with others and not having to um, go along with society deems as normal when you get to a certain age. The way that the book is divided up, um, there's like two ways I think she divides it up, it's been a while since I read this, um, and at first I think it goes through different locations are the different chapters and then it changes to the menstrual cycle and I found that really interesting because you can see how the hormones are influencing the protagonist's thoughts and actions and the conversations that she's having and what she wants in life and you know that's really true to life when you're going through your menstrual cycle you know your wants and needs and the way that you relate to others does change and fluctuate and the way that she captured that, especially when it relates to motherhood, was so well done. And I just felt like it was really important to give a voice to people who, you know, don't want to be mothers or don't know if they want to be mothers, but they're maybe leaning towards no. Because as a woman or as someone who has a uterus, you do get that pressure from pretty early on. Like, do you want to be a mum? Like, oh, I can't wait till you have kids. Like, oh, you're going to be such a great parent. And it's so weird to put this, like, massive expectation on a person without even knowing if that's what they want for themselves. So I found Sheila Hetty's exploration and excavation of herself within this book, like, just really authentic, and I loved it so much. I have Department of Speculation by Jenny Awful next. This book is so slim. And because it's kind of written in that fragmented style, I read it in like one afternoon and I don't really cry at books ever, but this book made me tear up more than once. I found it extremely emotional and extremely raw and extremely honest. Um, I guess it's about the coming apart of a marriage and you find out about the coming together of these people. and. I feel like I don't want to say too much about this book because I didn't really know a lot going into it and I think that that really helped me experience it fully but Jenny Awful just has such a way of being emotional without it being over the top um, and I just found it so masterful that she was really making me feel so many things without saying too much. Her tone was just like perfect and it felt, it just felt very real and there was a lot about family life in there. I'm reading a lot about mothers and wives. But um, yeah, there's a lot of family life in there ju that just felt so, I don't know, authentic and hearing the things that you necessarily wouldn't hear real people talking about because they don't want to feel guilty or they don't want um, judgment. But when you read it in books, it almost makes you feel like it's okay that people struggle or people can't do things perfectly and I feel like Department of Speculation and Motherhood were two really really good books for almost giving you permission to just be a human and not get everything right. Okay the next book definitely takes a different theme, uh, Check Out 19 by Claire Louise Bennett which is basically a love letter to reading and writing and as someone who loves reading and writing, it just felt like the protagonist was taking me by the hand and showing me all the books that informed her tastes growing up and then informed her transition to from girlhood to womanhood and also it had a lot to say about being a working class artist and as a working class artist that was just really, really... Um, like reassuring to read about because um, a lot of the time I feel like I'm reading books like Rachel Cusk for example who's writing, I can't fault, her writing is amazing, I love her style, I love especially her vocabulary, I always find myself in awe at her word choice but I can never really relate to what she's writing because it's very uh, 
middle class and she never really seems aware, like self-aware. Um, but when I was reading Checkout 19, that felt very, it just felt really relatable to me, especially the way that she goes about her student life and just the way that kind of books and stories have been her best friends growing up and the challenges that come with being a working class artist and how you don't, you will never have the same opportunities as those with more privilege than you because, you know, you have to work whilst you're at uni and you can't take internships that don't pay and you can't go off and do residencies because you've got to go work and yeah I just felt like it was someone who fell in love with something and then dedicated their life to it and was trying really really hard to you know make their life about that thing I don't know if I'm describing it well. Claire Louise Bennett is a master at listing things like she can write really good lists and I know that sounds odd but if you read the book or if you've read the book you'll know that there's a lot of listing that goes on and the imagery and the rhythm and the musicality of these lists is like hypnotic and then within the book which is about this protagonist and her life and her love of stories there's also a story within the story that the protagonist has written and she's revisiting it as an adult and almost rewriting it and I thought that that was just a wonderful choice and thing to do. It's playing with form, it gives you a break in between. Um, yeah, I would recommend this book to anybody who basically wants to read a novel length love letter to reading and writing. <laughs> okay, and next we have a book that I just read very recently, um, An Apprenticeship or the Book of Pleasures by Clarice Lispector. This book was unlike anything I'd ever read before. The, oh, the storyline seems, or the plot seems so simple. We have man and woman falling in love. Um, but instead of love being like this final destination and the climax of the book, which it tends to be quite often in books and in films, um, it's like a catalyst instead of a destination. So this love that... The protagonist Laurie has for this man is almost like this catalyst for her really discovering herself and allowing herself to blossom into the full version of herself allowing her to she uses like this love to evolve the one thing that I didn't like about it was that she, she couldn't figure this out by herself and the man had to like gift her this opportunity and say to her like come back to me when you're when you are fully in love with yourself, when you've, you know, fully experienced your whole self. And if a man spoke to me the way that he speaks to Laurie in the book, I would be like, goodbye. But Laurie is not like that. She was like, yes, okay. And you have this uh, book that is just filled with the most gorgeous writing in the entire world, I think. I've never read anything that captivated me so much. Um, I think basically every single sentence on every single page was underlined and dog-eared. Um, but yeah, you have this story that you think is maybe going to go one way, but then branches off into this whole other exploration of self. And there's a lot of spirituality and desire and identity. And I felt myself kind of unraveling as I was reading it because my mind was <laughs> kind of going off in this existential crisis but it was like a really beautiful existential crisis. And I could definitely only take the book, I said this in my previous video, I could only have this book in small sips. I couldn't gulp it, I couldn't devour it, but I'm really glad that I just had a little sip at a time because it meant I got to savor this like stunning writing. And I would highly, highly, highly recommend this book to anybody who likes good writing. If you read books for the writing, then you need to read Lispector. I am shocked and appalled that it took myself this long to finally read her, but now I can't wait to dive into the world of Clarissa Spector and read many more of her books. And then I have a poetry collection on here. So I did not read as much poetry as I would have liked to this year, but I did read Averno by Louise Gluck, and I thought that it was just like a really stunning collection and a lot of the time when I'm reading poetry collections it's like essay collections or short story collections 
it'll feel like this, like maybe like this, maybe like this. Um, but with Averno, I loved every single poem and they felt so cohesive and it felt, it almost felt like I was reading like one entire thing rather than like broken apart poems. Like I know that they were, but it just felt so cohesive. And um, so there's a lot of uh, mythological uh, ties in it because uh, Louise Gluck is kind of retelling the story of Persephone and going to the underworld and so there's a lot of ties between Greek mythology but also human nature and the natural world and how they're so interlinked and how one um, influences the other and back and forth and how everything's like a cycle and life and death and yeah I've dipped back into it a couple of times just to read particular poems and I think that I'll be doing that for a long time to come. It's probably possibly one of the, is it the best poetry collection I've ever read? It might be. It just kind of had all my favourite things, like mythology, the natural world, human nature, love, desire, death, it's got it all. I, I really, really enjoyed it. And then last on my fiction list, I have Antigone by Sophocles. And <laughs> this might seem like a total jump from all of the other books that I've mentioned, being as it's completely ancient and it's a play, it's a drama, but reading Antigone this year, something happened within me. I was just completely taken away by all of it. I loved the character of Antigone. I loved her spirit and how she was, you know, really defiant against what seemed like a corrupt government and she had so much goodness in her heart that she wanted to fight to and she just knew her morals and she knew what she stood for and I love, I love when a young woman does that so it was just a really like uplifting although heartbreaking but it has such tragedy within it, it is a Greek tragedy um, and I do really love plays, in the past I've read a lot of plays and I feel like Antigone has really made me feel like I want to read more so I think that you know I think that might send me down the path of reading more it's not my favorite Greek tragedy Medea is my favorite Greek tragedy by far but Antigone is is definitely second and I feel like if you haven't really read many plays or if you haven't read any Greek tragedies then Antigone is like a really good place to start because it's quite short and it's not as horrendously heartbreaking as Medea is because, oh my god, but yeah, there's some really good, um, some really good speeches, some really interesting characters, and yeah, let's, let's talk about Greek mythology and Greek dramas. <laughs> okay, moving on to my non-fiction. The first one I have here, remember this is in no particular order. Um, So the first one I have here is A Horse at Night on Writing by Mina Kane. I just read this earlier this week, I think. And reading this felt like a really close friend of mine just sitting me down and talking me through why she loves doing what she does, which is writing, why she loves her craft, the authors and writers that have inspired her, the protagonists that she cannot get out of her head, landscapes that have left a lasting impression on her and it yeah it just really felt like a very close friend telling you all about their craft and why they've come to love it and the challenges that they face and honestly it was like very light-hearted compared to a lot of what I've read <laughs> recently and what I tend to read in general um my friend Lydia um I will tag her Instagram downstairs because it's beautiful and you should really be following her um, she had messaged me asking, do you have any light-hearted reads? Because I feel like I keep reading really depressing things. And I had to reply saying, no, <laughs> uh, I really don't. Most of what I read feels very heavy as well. If you find anything, please let me know. She read A Horse at Night by Amina Kane and said that it was the perfect antidote to all the heaviness that she'd been reading. So I was like, okay picked it up, read it, and she was completely right. It was like a remedy to all this heavy literature that I tend to take on. 
and it felt like a breath of fresh air and it definitely inspired me writing wise and yeah I would recommend this if you are a writer it's almost like having a little master class with a really great writer telling you everything that has inspired them and keeps them going and why they love doing what they do. I have Everybody, a book about freedom next by Olivia Lang. I do not know how to explain how much every single person needs to read this book. Everybody is for everybody. If you have a body, you should read Everybody by Olivia Lang. I was very lucky enough that they were speaking at Glasgow University when I was reading this book and so I went to the talk and it was phenomenal. They're one of my favourite writers and so it just felt incredible getting to hear them talk about this book in particular. So I would say it's like political discourse but also blended with personal memoir and the way that they come together is like seamless and there's a lot of history and Lang turns to linger on a few figures throughout time and they're very interesting they're not necessarily the figures that people would immediately think of and so yeah I was fully engaged with this book I could not put it down I kept taking photos of passages and like sending them to people there's a lot about um, the liberation of bodies can freedom ever really be freedom? Which the answer is no. There's always constraints within freedom. And uh, bodies as political protest. And yeah, I, if you have a body, this book is for you. It doesn't, It even though it's like very heavy subject matter, it reads very easily. It didn't feel too dense or anything like that, which I think Lang has such a skill for making really intense and heavy and intellectual subjects very digestible oh god i feel like i might need to reread that soon just because it was so good um then i have upstream by mary oliver which is a collection of essays about nature and reading and writing and childhood and growing up mary oliver I love that woman. She can write. I I think I genuinely like fell in love with this book. So one, the cover is stunning. But two, I really like descriptive nature writing and this was like a whole other level. Just hearing about the way that Mary Oliver lives her life and how simple and how slow it is, but also how full it is for her. Full of inspiration, full of love, full of practice, full of craft, full of art. It was, oh, it was delicious. I love this book so much. If you haven't really read any nature writing, this would be a really good place to start because it's not boring in any way. And I think that the thought of nature writing is maybe a little bit boring for a lot of people, but this book was entirely captivating just because of how stunning it was. The descriptions were so moving. And one of the best writers of our time has, you know, created this collection of essays which shows you her transition through life from how she used to uh, like copy out her favourite passages from her favourite writers in books to one of the most well-known poets like ever. Um, and then all the in-between of this house that she lived in, the pets that she's had, the relationships she's had, the walks that she's taken every day to kind of stir her mind into working and writing. Yeah, I just, I love writers writing about writing. I love any artist sharing their practice and their craft. And this was one of those books where I couldn't get enough. I was like, I'm learning how she does this. This is amazing. I'm learning what she loves and what makes her want to write. And oh my God, yes. I feel like I'm like, being so over the top about my love for all of these books but genuinely like a lot of them made me feel like my heart was going to burst because I loved them so much and Upstream was definitely one of those books. Then I have Bluettes by Maggie Nelson which is almost written like a journal like quite short journal entries relating to the colour blue but 
it is very deeply layered and tangential and conversational and honest and very intimate and it speaks about art and it speaks about so many personal things and history and oh god yeah I just feel like I'm being like oh my god about all these books but that's truly how I felt I've dipped back into Bluettes time and time again and I feel like that is a book that I will like to have close by me for the rest of my life um, Maggie Nelson is highly intellectual but she's also she writes in a way that feels so relatable because it feels like she's very honest and very vulnerable in her work and this was a book that it didn't quite make me cry but I was like on the verge like I felt really emotional reading Bluettes and I think that this would be a perfect gift for someone that you really love in your life it doesn't need to be like a romantic love but just yeah I think Bluettes is like the perfect book for gifting to people and then the last non-fiction I have is another Olivia Lang and it's uh, Funny Weather, Art in an Emergency and I just said that I love writers, writing about writing and learning about artists and their craft and their process. This is basically an entire essay collection on this. So Olivia Lang has written essays about different artists across many disciplines. They're grouped into disciplines. So you have the painters, the photographers, the writers, the musicians, and it basically gives you a profile of the artist and then an essay about their most important works and what influenced them and some pivotal things in their life and like that was I like I felt like oh, that is the book that I needed because I just love learning about craft and it felt like this essay collection was the epitome of that <laughs> you have all all these like really well-known artists and you're learning about them as a person, them as an artist and then their artwork and I was really happy because Georgia O'Keeffe was in there and she's she's one of my favorite artists ever so it was really really great. Okay so I filmed that video last night and was editing it this morning and realized that my camera had cut me off but somehow miraculously as I got to the end of what I was saying about my last book in that list so some kind of divine timing but I was speaking for about 10 minutes to completely nobody because I wasn't speaking to you because it wasn't recording and I was talking about the last book that I read and what my first book of the new year was going to be so well now it is the first so happy new year I hope you closed 2022 and opened 2023 in a gorgeous fashion. Um, but yeah, so the book that I ended 2022 with was O Caledonia by Elspeth Barker. Now this is my book club pick for, for December and I'd wanted to read it for quite a while, um, but it was in the back of my mind, it wasn't something that felt urgent. Um, I think it was Julie from Linen Librarian that had posted she was reading it and it kind of reignited this like hunger for a Scottish Gothic and I'm glad that she brought it to my attention. So the way my book club works is that I pick two titles and then we all vote and it was between O Caledonia and Our Wives Under the Sea. And it was a very close call, but Oh Caledonia did win. Um, I will read Our Wives Under the Sea still because that does sound very good, but I'm so glad that this is what we read because it was just perfect for being in grey, cold Scotland because that's exactly what this is. Um, the premise of the book is, is a coming of age story. We follow Janet, who's the oldest of five siblings. And we follow her from when she's very young to when she's 16 and found lying murdered at the bottom of a stone staircase in the castle that they live in. Um, that's not giving anything away because that is how the book starts. It is almost like a character study of Janet, but also of Ochnesaw, the house, well, the castle that they live in. 
and that's one of my favourite things about gothic literature, when the house becomes its own character and it's such a looming presence. And the house at Oxnard is so, so that. It's such a visual book, it's highly detailed. I really felt like I was completely immersed in the world that Barker created. I think it's quite similar to um, the details of her own life in terms of living way up north with her family in this big old house or mansion that was then turned into a prep school. But yeah, it's very moody, very dark, very Scottish. There was lots of Scots words that I was coming across that I just hadn't heard in ages and that was really delightful. Because um, I feel a lot of people in Scotland, certainly myself, feel very divorced from our own culture. Like we have a few things left but not a lot, like we don't even really speak our own language at all anymore. It wasn't taught in my school, it isn't taught in most schools, so it was just nice to come across a lot of very specific Scottish dialects and you could tell the different ones, like there was a very specific Aberdonian dialect that was in there for sure and yeah, I just really really love this book. Looking at my favourites list now, I would put this in there for sure. Yeah, I don't want to say too much on here about it because I do kind of want to save what I want to say for the book club chat, but if you like um, a really visual story that you can get lost in and you're very drawn to character studies of a protagonist, it's it's a really, really good book for that. Um, it's not massively plot heavy, I would say if you're drawn to books for the character, then this would be a really good choice. Um, but yeah, I'm so glad that Julie just put my mind back on this book because it was such a winner. I love this so much. Yeah. <laughs> and then my first book for this year, I haven't read a lot yet, I've just started it, is Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan. Um, my boyfriend just finished reading it. He finished, I think this was his last book of last year. Um, but he said I would love it, that it's like small town Ireland. I think it's in the 80s. It's around about winter, Christmas time and very small community. Um, kind of like uh, dark undertones, very moody and I was like yes that does sound like I'd like it. I often tend to avoid um, prize lists. Um, this was shortlisted for the booker. I think it was shortlisted for the booker. Yeah, it was shortlisted for the booker. And I don't tend to read things because they've been nominated or have won prizes. Um, because I have such a problem with being told what to do and sometimes I feel like if I was to read a prize list or if I was to pick something up just because it was on a prize list, it's almost like I'm doing it because I've been told to do it. Um, but I think I will really enjoy this. I'm only 26 pages in, but so far I'm enjoying it. Um, yeah, what else was I chatting to you about when it wasn't recording. Oh, I think I'd said that my main reading intention for last year was to read more backlisted titles um, because I think in 2021 I'd gotten really caught up in, in the current publishing cycle and it doesn't usually happen to me but for some reason in 2021 it did and like I just said, like I don't really like being told what to do and I feel like that's how I can sometimes feel when I get caught in the current publishing cycle is like it's like I'm being trapped in a cycle of reading what I'm being told I should be reading rather than discovering things myself or through recommendations from other people and you know looking backwards through all of the books that we already have um, and this year that was what I was focusing on and I feel like I did pretty well. It's definitely something I'll be carrying on into this year, uh, like focusing on reading a lot of backlisted titles. Like I found a lot of gems that way and yeah, I guess that rebellious side of me just doesn't want to be reading what publishers think that I should be reading because of commercialization and capitalism. <laughs> yeah, so... 
Happy New Year. I would love to hear what your first read of this year is going to be, or if you've already started it, what it is, and how you closed off your literary year for 2022. I'd also love to hear that. Um, I'm planning on filming a video which would be my reading intentions for 2023 and um, my 23 books for 2023. Um, yeah. But I'd love to hear what you started your year with reading and I hope that 2023 brings you lots of love and lots of happiness and lots of really good books. <laughs>